one of the favorite people that I've gotten to know in my 30 years of involvement with the World War II Roundtable is uh, Pat O'Donnell. Um, as I mentioned, his first book was Beyond Valor. Uh, he has got a unique technique, but it's in, very involved in uh, veteran stories. He takes the veteran stories, weaves it into a historical uh, foundation, and, uh, and I think you'll see that he's a very emotional guy uh, emotionally attached to telling these stories. I've seen him a couple of times. Uh, he lives in the D.C. area, and if you watch C-SPAN on the weekends, sometimes you'll see uh, see him on C-SPAN uh, doing, uh, doing an event. But, uh, Pat, we're so glad to have you back. It's good uh, to be here, and it just feels like kind of coming home. This is my fifth appearance at the round table. You know, in one way or another, all of my books are sort of have that, that relate to that passion. And I, I'm going to talk about two of those books tonight, uh, Washington's Immortals and First Seals. Washington's Immortals, because first, because we wouldn't even be here had it not been for the men in Washington's Immortals. And people have asked me, how did you go from World War II, seven books in World War II, to the American Revolution? And like all my books, they, the story has found me in one way or another. And that story began about six years ago when I was in New York City and the commanding officer of 3-1, who I was in the Battle of Fallujah with as an embedded historian. I was a, I was a volunteer. I volunteered my own time. I was armed with an M16. I was in uniform and ended up clearing houses with his unit and almost dying multiple times. I was ambushed by, by Chechens. I was, I, in a firefight, I pulled a Marine that had half his face blown off by an RPK machine gun. Um, the closeness that you get with people like that when you're in battle with them is hard to describe. And it turns out that Colonel Buell is also a historian. I first met him on November 18th 2004, in the midst of the Battle of Fallujah, in an aid station that was actually an Al-Qaeda aid station. This is the precursor to ISIS. The floors were coated with blood. There was stuff all over the place. And he asked me who I was, and I said, I'm a combat historian, and I specialize in World War II. And in the middle of the Battle of Fallujah, he goes, my father-in-law fought on the Eastern Front with the German army. And immediately we created a rapport. And literally not more than five minutes after we're looking at this aid station, blood on the floor and everything else, I saw the light shift in the, in the wall next to me. And there was a figure moving. And it, it literally within seconds, the platoon that I was with, second platoon, was hit and we, we lost another man. It was, it was a massive firefight. The colonel said, in, uh, he quoted Pat, and he's like, gentlemen, I want to see a symphony of fire. Everyone opened up where these insurgents were at, and that quelled things. And I remained, I stayed in touch with the colonel. And about six years ago, I was in New York City, and he said to me, Pat, do you want to go to the Met? I said, no, sir. Let's do a battlefield tour of Brooklyn the Battle of Brooklyn and the American Revolution. You know, it's one thing to go tour the art museum with somebody, but when you're in battle with somebody, it's really special to go walk hallowed ground with somebody you fought with. And the Colonel and I met at Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. And this is where the largest battle of the American Revolution began. Interestingly enough, it began in a watermelon patch right outside of where the gates are now, of Greenwood Cemetery, at a place called the Red Lion Inn. And at the time, the Red Lion Inn was a tourist attraction. They had a watermelon patch in the backyard. They had a stone that said they had the devil's hoof print, supposedly. But on August 26 and 27, 1776, British, picket, British uh, basically uh, scouts ran into American pickets outside of the Red Lion Inn. And this touches off the largest battle of the American Revolutionary War. 
and we went inside of Greenwood Cemetery. If you've ever been, I mean, I think it's probably the most interesting cemetery in America because it's not only uh, hallowed ground, it's the site of a battlefield, but it also contains some of the most interesting uh, characters in American history, like Boss Tweed and several Civil War generals are buried there, the who's who of, of New York. We walked up and down the hills of Greenwood Cemetery where the American line was positioned on hills and they defended those hills. And we walked uh, through the alleys of, of Brooklyn and I found a stone house. It's a reproduct, it's, it's the original stones. But at that house is probably the most epic small unit engagement in American history. And probably very few people in this room have heard about it. But there were five companies of Marylanders that it was their first major battle. They positioned themselves outside that house and they charged several times into the house that was occupied by Colonel, by General Earl Cornwallis. And their actions saved the American army that was positioned on, on the heights of Guanas near the, the cemetery. And they allowed the bulk of the American army to escape through the hole that they created. They charged multiple times, they closed ranks, they were hit with canister and grape and musket fire. Many of these men died on the field of battle, but they, they, they allowed the American army to fight another day. And that's just the beginning of this epic story, Washington's Immortals. This is the first Band of Brother history of, of, of the American Revolution. It's not a, a dry history book. It focuses on the main individuals, the enlisted men and the officers of the, of the Maryland line, and they fought in every major, revo major revolutionary war battle in the North and the South. They fight, they, they allowed the army to escape at Brooklyn Heights, they then fight, they allow, I mean, one of the greatest retreats in, in world history occur, occurs where the American army, a couple days after, that, after the, the, the scene at the house, escape across the East River into Manhattan under the cover of fog. They then fight again at Central Park where the entire army melts away, but the Marylanders still stand. This becomes Amer Washington's, these are Washington's first elite unit, the Marylanders, and they're also his shock troops. They hold at a place called McGowan's Pass, which is now Central Park. They're involved in the Battle of Harlem Heights. If, you've, if you know where the, they, they fight at White Plains, at a place called Chatterham Hill. And if you're, if you're familiar with New York City and you know where the George Washington Bridge is at, that during the American Revolution was a mile and a half long fort known as Fort Washington. The Marylanders, they had a, a contingent of Marylanders that are inside of that fort. And some of the most interesting stories of Washington's immortals come from pension files. And what a pension file is for the American Revolution is if you were lucky enough to survive the American Revolution, you go down to the local courthouse in 1820 or 1830 and swear under oath what you did. And it's those personal stories that are in this book. It makes it very unique. And let me give you one example. Lawrence Everhart. And Everhart was a Marylander that was positioned in Fort Washington. There are about 2,800 Americans in Fort Washington. And about a week before the, the, the Battle of Fort Washington, the adjutant, who was the second of command, basically left the fort with the plans and the entire order of battle and delivered it to the British, which made the, the men in the fort very vulnerable. The thing that makes the American Revolution unique is not only that were we fighting against the most adaptable army in the world at the time, one of the greatest armies in the world at the time, we're also fighting against Americans. We're beat, we're, this is a first American Civil War where up to a third, if not more, of Americans were loyal to the crown and there were constantly situations of betrayal. Many of the men in the Maryland line, they had divided loyalties. They had to betray their father's wishes just to fight, to fight for the cause. So they're constantly, there's this constant element to deal with. And um, on, in November, the British uh, surround Fort Washington, and Lawrence Everhart, this Marylander, in his pension file, we find out he's probably the luckiest man of the American Revolution. He was able to find a rowboat, and he was able to row across the Hudson River and, and, and escape 
the carnage that occurs in Fort, Fort Washington. What happens is the Hessians and British, the Hessians being the German allies of the British Army, and the, and the British surround the fort, they breach the walls, they know where the, the strong and weak points are, they know where the order of battle is, and they're able to overwhelm the defenders inside of Fort Washington. And it's, it's a disaster. They're, they're, our men are butchered by many of these Hessian soldiers. They're bayoneted to death. And Everhart makes his way across the river, and he encounters George Washington, who sees what's going on in his spyglass to his men in Fort Washington. And the pension application captures an important scene. This is not um, a dry history of the American Revolution. It's about sort of the hidden war, the feelings and emotions many of these men went through. And, you know, we think of Washington as this kind of very stoic figure that, you know, I think of an oil painting or you think of a dollar bill or whatever. It's, he sees Washington crying as these men are being butchered to death. That's what this book is about. It's a band of brothers. It's a personal view of the American Revolution. The Marylanders fight through the entire war at Valley Forge, at Delaware. They march 4,600 miles, most of it barefoot in the South, fighting the Army, the British Army, and fighting fellow Americans. And it's without pay in most cases. There's no pay. There's no, the, the, they don't have shoes. And they fight, and they, they, they somehow pull off a miracle. And they fight at places like Camden, South Carolina, where in the summer of 1780, Don Patton even had his, some of his relatives at Camden. And Camden is a forgotten battlefield, like many of the battlefields of the South. It's here that in August 1780, Gates, who's the, the hero, supposedly, of Saratoga, assembles the Great Army, the Great Southern Army, that's what it's called. And the, it includes mostly a militia, uh, about 4,000 uh, men in total. But the backbone of that army, the Great Army, it's the Marylanders. It's a division of Marylanders. It's several regiments. And it's also, it's also a De the Delaware Blues, a regiment of them, which I cover in this book. And the army faces Cornwallis once again. And it's, it's, a, it's an incredible story. The army, the, Gates raises forces improperly. He puts his weakest men, the militia, on, on the right where he should be putting, he should be facing the other, the, the opposing force, the British force, with his, which includes their elite unit. Instead we have, it's not the Marylanders facing elite unit, it's militia against the British elite unit. And it's a disaster. It's one of the great epic defeats in American history. The, the army is destroyed practically. The Marylanders are in full flight. The, uh, the Gates is in full flight. Basically almost uh, rides all the way to Charlotte in two days, which is a, practically a world record. But they rebuild the army over the Marylanders, who are the most ardent, in most cases, members of the Continental Army. They fight through eight long years of war. And that story... I'll tell just a little bit more about it, begins in the winter of 1774 in Baltimore City, where men of honor, family, and fortune come together to form the first independent company of Marylanders called the Baltimore Independent Cadets. These men, who are the wealthiest members of, of the city, basically put their entire fortunes on the line for the cause, and they go into bankruptcy after the war in many cases, and many of them die as well. And they form what's known as the Baltimore Independent Cadets, which becomes Smallwood's Battalion and the First Marylanders. But this core group of men, we see they, they fight through the entire war, and they hold the army together in, in some of its darkest hours. And they're at places like uh, Cowpens, where they turn the tide there, where if, you know, if you've ever seen the movie Patriot, there's a composite battle, which is a little bit like Cowpens. And Cowpens is, is an extraordinary place. You, all of these, many of these battlefields, you can walk today. And the lucky ones are, are owned by the, na the, the National Park Service. But many, many of these battlefields aren't. For instance, Princeton, which Doug mentioned earlier, is endangered. 
A lot of the stuff in Trenton and Princeton isn't even marked. Some of the greatest battles in American history that formed this country, there's not even an interpretive sign. It's an absolute disgrace. And, you know, getting sort of to that, what I found is the Colonel and I walked the Stone House and we walked around the area and we found a rusted old sign that said, here lie 256 Continental soldiers, Maryland heroes. Somewhere near the Stone House, a couple blocks away, are the bodies of these men, the bodies of the men of family, fortune, and honor that are buried in a mass grave that nobody, that, that their exact location remains unknown. And I wrote this book to hopefully find these men and, and to tell their story. And I think, you know, it's, it's time that we, we find the men of family, fortune, and honor. And we honor the, the Revolutionary War generation. It's so important to this day. The next book I'm going to talk about is First Seals. It's on the OSS Maritime Unit. And this story begins on De in December 1941 in Alexandria Harbor, where six Italian frogmen infiltrate the harbor and sink two British battleships and destroy a tanker. That incident set off an underwater arms race. The United States was the furthest behind. We didn't have Navy SEALs. We didn't even have practically special operations forces at that time. Nothing existed. There was no UDT, period. The United States turned to, to someone to try to combat and to basically to enter that race and potentially win it. And the United States government turned to the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, in 1941, which is probably the most extraordinary organization ever created in America because it, it was formed from extraordinary men and women that I've interviewed 4,000 World War II veterans, and the men and women of the OSS, I've interviewed about five or 600 of them, are probably the most interesting and extraordinary individuals, not only what they did during the war, but also after. And in 1941 and 1942, the OSS was our first national intelligence agency, but it was also our first special operations forces. And this is everything from the US Army Green Berets, which are operational groups, to morale operations or psychological operations. But in 1941, the OSS created something called the Maritime Authority, which later became the Maritime Unit. And it was all built around technology that we didn't have. And this is a story of innovation, entrepreneurship. We did not have operational scuba gear or something called a rebreather. And what that is, is the ability for a combat swimmer to swim underwater and not leave a telltale sign of bubbles. The OSS had to de develop this technology overnight. And they turned to two individuals, a guy by the name of Brown, who he was a salvage guy, he was a hard hat diver in the Great Lakes, to develop some sort of a rebreather where you could actually rebreathe your own oxygen underwater at closed circuit. And they also turned to a young medical student at the University of Pennsylvania named Christian Lambertson. And Lambertson, in 1942, um, the OSS worked with both of these individuals to develop this technology. And the first operational test of Lambertson unit, Lambertson's unit, the LARU, occurred on November 17, 1942, at the Omni Shoreham Hotel in Washington, <laughs> D.C. It's practically winter in Washington, and the OSS needed a place to test the, the scuba gear. So, the, so armed guards were placed near the to doors of the pool, guests were cleared away, and Dr. Christian Lambertson, or Christian Lambertson at the time, along with an extraordinary small group of men, tested the gear in the pool. And within that group was a gentleman by the name of H.G.A. Woolley. And Woolley was, a, was part of the Royal Navy, 
in, in World War I. He was a hero of, of, of uh, Jutland. And he was also a naval attache in Washington, D.C., but he was also an American, interestingly enough. He had dual citizenship, and he was a screenwriter in Hollywood, California prior to the war. And he, this gentleman had a knack for developing ideas into reality. And he brought together Lambertson and Brown, and also another extraordinary individual, a guy by the name of Jack Taylor. And Jack Taylor was a dentist from Hollywood, California, interestingly enough, who knew Woolley. But Jack Taylor was no ordinary t dentist. This was, an, this was an adventurer. This is a man that somehow dug his way out of a gold mine that collapsed. He sailed halfway around the world by himself. He was an expert swimmer. He flew airplanes. And anyways, Jack Taylor and Christian Lambertson that day, that night on November 17th, tested the LARU and made history. And it was here that an entire set of tactics and technology were spawned. And everything had to be developed. Scuba fins, wetsuits, dive watches, underwater submersibles, teams of men, all were created within the OSS Maritime Unit. It spawned, it, just from a small handful of men, it, it was spawned an entire group of, of SEALs. And the money wasn't there, but that didn't stop these men. They had a very limited budget. They needed a submarine. They innovated. They went down to the Washington Yacht Club and bought two rotting cabin cruisers and made them into their submarines. They, went, then, they, they then created a, a, a secret base called Area D, which is right across from uh, Quantico on the Maryland side. And they started to test the, the equipment. They, they, they brought men together into combat teams of swimmers, which had never been done in the United States prior to that. They not only, they not only taught men how to swim underwater with this gear, but also conducted boat operations. They, were, they became parachute qualified, which is something, which is a hallmark of today's Navy SEALs. And they started to train and develop these teams of men. And Jack Taylor was the first to go overseas. He went to uh, Cairo, Italy, uh, Egypt, where Taylor, who's a, a lowly Navy lieutenant at the time, has to set up an entire base of operations. And it's an extraordinary story. You know, if you've, if you've seen the guns of Navarone, this is the, the Aegean at the time, which is heavily controlled by the Germans. They're everywhere. They have control of the air and the sea. And Jack Taylor conducts missions by himself in some of these islands, running supplies, running, inserting agents, and then doing the spying himself. This is a man of action. And here, this, this book is an ex a collection of interesting people. Here he meets Sterling T uh, Hayden, the famous movie actor that you've seen on Dr. Strangelove and other movies later on. Hayden is, is a member of the OSS and a real, the real deal as well. Um, he eventually wins or is awarded the, the Silver Star for his actions behind the lines. And the two men develop a nice chemistry. They're involved um, in operations in that area. And the war then shifts into Italy. And here, um, Hayden and Taylor conduct some of the great, some great and extraordinary missions. They, for instance, a, um, a C-47 that's loaded with nurses crashes behind the lines in Albania. And it's Taylor and Hayden who organize that mission to get them out. They're, they, they successfully uh, accomplish the mission. And they also, they, the Italians at this time have, uh, have changed sides. So there's massive amounts of war materials, everything from uniforms to shoes to, to guns. And then they start to run those weapons across to the Yugoslav partisans and, and, and equip them with the, 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 the former, um, their former Axis uh, enemy. And interestingly enough, 
The OS does, does something even more novel and innovative and out of the box. That former enemy, Decima Moss, the men that actually sank those two British battleships in Alexandria Harbor, they recruit them into the OSS. Half the unit fights for the Axis during the war, and the other half joins the Allies. The men are vetted, and they become part of the San Marco Battalion, which is part of the OSS, and they conduct some of the most interesting and extraordinary operations inside of Italy. They capture the plans for the, the Gothic line, which allows, them, which allows the Allies to breach part of the line later on in the war. Crucial intelligence, actionable intelligence. These men are able to gather it. They're conducting commando-like operations behind the lines with Decima Moss and men like Taylor. And it, there's assassinations, there's high-value targets, there's it's, it's blending special operations with intelligence. These men are literally 20 to 30 years ahead of their time. Much of what we see today looks like the World War II OSS and some of the, the operations that they run. And what happens is the teams that are developed by, initially by Taylor, they fan out around the world. One team becomes part of UDT-10, which joins the Navy, and they basically help lead or spearhead many of the invasions in the, Central, in the, in the Pacific War. Um, interestingly enough, the UDT teams of World War II don't want anything to do with advanced technology like a rebreather or scuba gear. There, the uh, scuba gear is, is demonstrated to um, Draper Kaufman in Florida, and the men of the maritime unit are kicked out. And the documents on this are on online if you want to look at them. They don't want anything to do with it. Interestingly enough, they didn't even use uh, uh, flippers until the OSS showed up. Down there, they were swimming in tennis shoes. None of the, uh, the tactics that we see today, it's, it's all OSS, it's all, and interestingly enough, the, the knowledge exchange occurs when they, they team up with the San Marco men and the Decima Moss men, that technology transfers over to OSS, so all that institutional knowledge is transferred to the OSS, and they start to incorporate things. And it's, you, the, the men of the maritime unit fight in both the Pacific and in Europe, and the, probably the most interesting and extraordinary <coughs> mission is the DuPont mission, which is Jack Taylor's personal mission at, near the end of the war. It's 1944, and the Allies are desperate to get information out of, out of Austria. And Jack is not a chairborn guy at all. He is a man of action. He leads a team into Austria. He parachutes in. And the team is not a, just a made up of OSS operatives. It's made up of three other individuals who are known as deserter volunteers. The OSS was short on agents that could speak German and knew the culture. So they, they went into POW cages and, and actively recruited people that were deserters. And they vetted these men and then they trained them for about six months. And Taylor's team involved three of these individuals. And he parachutes into Austria and it's, it's tragic. It's his, the radio that he has, which is the lifeline of any mission behind the lines, is, is dropped into a lake. So Jack and the team are behind the lines without a means of communication with the base. Nevertheless, he, for a month, he operates clandestinely. He gathers intelligence, carefully compiles it. And about a month later, the Gestapo find Jack Taylor and the rest of the team, and they're 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 brutally tortured. Taylor's thrown into um, a, a prison in Vienna, and um, barely survives that incident. And it just gets worse for Jack Taylor. Jack Taylor is an American that's then thrown into Mauthausen concentration camp and builds the crematorium in the camp brick by brick and somehow survives. He's put on the death list for the, the camp three or four times. He knows people that are inside that create the list and they, they, actually, they actually 
put him off the list each time. And literally the day that he's supposed, the day or two before he's supposed to be executed, an armored unit breaks through the gates of Malthausen concentration camp and liberates it. And if you ever want to see something really extraordinary, go on the internet and do Jack Taylor plus Malthausen film. And the Signal Corps recorded the day that Jack Taylor was liberated at Malthausen. And, you know, it's, the words are amazing. I'm Lieutenant Senior Grade Jack H. Taylor, U.S. Navy, Hollywood, California. Believe it or not, this is the first time I've ever been in the movies. And somehow Jack Taylor survives. And Jack Taylor then, who is, is barely alive, is emaciated, somehow is, is he, throughout this entire ordeal, has gathered evidence against his, his captors. And instead of going back to rest and relax in an OSS base camp, he volunteers to spend another month at Malthausen gathering evidence. And, Malth and, and here, he interviews the inmates, he gathers written evidence, photographs, he gathers the, the, the means that were used to torture him, a bullwhip, for instance, which still exists in the National Archives. It's in a locked vault, the evidence that Jack Taylor gathered. And he's then a, a witness at the Nuremberg trials. And he brings down the men that, that were his captors and brings them to justice. But that's just, that's just one story in an, a, an amazing book about, well, I should say it's a, it's a book about amazing people. Ama amazing men like Bob Maynard here, who not only did great things during World War II, but did great things after the war to build America. So thank you very much for your time tonight, and I'm happy to take your questions. Patrick, what drove the Maylanders? What, what kept them going? That's a great question. Um, what, his question was, what drove men to march 4,600 miles to betray their fathers, to fight the greatest army in the world at the time, and fight for eight long years? Through hyperinflation and everything else, and it's a it's a it's a combat it's many things, but a lot of it at the heart of it was a, a love for liberty. The 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 man that that formed the Baltimore Independent Cadets, the the heart and soul of the Marylanders was Mordecai Gist, and he was one of the survivors of the Stone House that reformed the assault against Cornwallis, and reformed the Marylanders multiple times. Each one of these officers. Had to, they they went and enlisted their own men. They had to recruit their own men every time, in their company. So it required a lot of charisma. And also, they they put their fortunes on the line in many cases. The the wealthiest individuals in this unit, Gist, paid for his own men's uh, uniforms, his their food, etc. And as the war progresses, it's not only the wealthiest families in 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 Baltimore but it's also some of the poorest. It also includes African Americans. About seven to nine percent of the unit was African American and other minorities within Maryland. But it's a love for liberty, and, and Gist, for instance, named his two sons states' rights and independence. That's how dedicated he was to the cause. So if you had a guess, where would you guess that the men that fought at the Stone House were buried? There's a, there's a lot of evidence there's documentary evidence that suggests that it's potentially in multiple locations, not just one. But it's near, interestingly enough, an American Legion post, the Michael Raleigh American Legion post, where the sign still hangs to this day. And next to it is an empty lot that spans, uh, it's a, practically a block across, and there's, there's a suspicion that the remains potentially could be there. And it's in private hands. <coughs> and earlier, Doug talked about Civil War Trust Fund. And they're, they're getting involved. And the, um, the trust also has something called Campaign 1776, where they're dedicating resources and entire staff to preserving Revolutionary War battlefields. And this is one of them, along with Princeton. And right now, Trenton, for instance, is com there's many sites there that are incredibly important to you know the ten crucial days that formed America. You know, not only the 
the great you know story on Christmas Day where Washington rose across the river, and here you know at Trenton, for instance, Henry Knox sets up his guns and fires down on the Hessians and Colonel Johann Rall. The place where he set up the guns, for instance, is filled with empty junk. It's a it's an empty lot filled with junk. There's no signs there. One of the greatest battles of the American Revolution occurs at the Second Battle of Trenton at a place called Assunpeake Creek. And the original stones from that bridge are still there. And there's, I mean, it was a situation, an inflection point. The Marylanders are constantly involved in many of these inflection points during the war. It's an elite unit. And here, against all odds, three bayoneted charges on that stone bridge. It's one of the only major crossing points of Assunpeake Creek. Cornwallis's men are stopped in a pitched battle, and there's not even an interpretive sign. You know, this is America. This is who we are, and, and it needs to be preserved. Uh, what happened to Taylor and Lambertson after the war? That's a great question. Um, Lambertson is, is, becomes a full-time professor at University of Pennsylvania, and the Navy brings him back. UDT brings him back. To, to train their men, and they bring back the rebreather that he developed. They conduct operations on submarines. This is all the stuff that Lambertson pioneered during the war. And there's a transfer of the knowledge that he gained from not only his own operations, but also the Italians and everything that was gathered. So there's a, there's a transfer of knowledge and, and tactics and technology, and this occurs over years of time. And Lambertson's rebreather is the gold standard, and it's used all the way up until the 1980s. Different, I mean, it's been different models and stuff that have been adjusted, but it's the uh, Navy SEALs and the Green Berets that use his rebreather that he develops in 1942, and it's, it's modified and, and expanded. Pat, when is that plaque at the shore I'm going to be dedicated? The plaque, uh, the, as, as Don mentioned, um, this, this place, um, the pool, is now a ballroom in the Shoreham Hotel, this historic Shoreham Hotel on Calvert Street in Washington, D.C. And in October uh, of this year, there will be a plaque that will be d dedicated to the men of the Maritime Unit. So and, if anybody's uh, there, go to the Shoreham. And, and incidentally... We're, we're, we've been told that uh, Sterling Hayden's uh, son will be there. I'd be interested to uh, know if you have an opinion about why the OSS fell out of favor after uh, Roosevelt's death. Well, a lot of things. Um, I think Bob Maynard, when we were having questions outside, sort of said it perfectly. Um, Donovan had lots of enemies with the Germans and the Japanese, but he had even more in Washington, D.C. J. Edgar Hoover, for one, was an absolute mortal enemy, and they, they, he had it in for the OSS. And um, while Bill Donovan was just an extraordinary individual, and one of the things that one of the veterans said to me, the OSS was Donovan, and Donovan was the OSS. This is a spirit that was imbued throughout this organization, and it was a spirit of willingness to, to fail, and a willingness to, to, to try new things and to, to risk-taking constantly. And it was an organization that thrived in chaos and was able to do things quite uh, successfully overnight. It's, it, it's an interesting organizational model that, that potentially is applicable today even more because they were all very nimble. And they, they, they provided, their, it was all built around individuals and ex interesting or extraordinary individuals that had skill sets and teams were formed around skill sets and expertise to accomplish a goal. And uh, there's a lot of lessons learned from the OSS. If I can adjust the word. No, the, wait, wait. Uh, We're gonna, Mike, Bob, wait, wait, wait. Uh oh, uh oh. <laughs> um, there are a couple things against Donovan. Oh, number one, on the negative side, he was a lousy administrator, and he was getting old, and he was regarded a loose cannon that no one could control. Uh, but other than that, uh, the, uh, the military was against him because he was uh, a part of the OSS. Uh, Navy had its intelligence uh, 
Army had its, State Department had its, and Edgar Hoover had his uh, intelligence, and there was, there was no bringing them together. They, they did them for, they sought information for their own purposes, uh, not for the national interest. And Donovan's idea of central intelligence was to bring them together, and they didn't like those things being taken away from them. The other thing, the, uh, the, uh, the press was against them, uh, because OSS jokingly was called oh so secret, and there were no press conferences, and the uh, press didn't have anything to do, and they resented it. Uh, there were there were other names for OSS too, oh so social, uh, oh so silly, and I, <laughs> some other uh, uh, less respectable names. But uh, it, 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 Donovan was a good man, and he thought he was going to be the head of the CIA, and the CIA was. Uh, based almost exactly on what Donovan had recommended. And uh, he was the, the logical candidate. But when Eisenhower became uh, uh, the president, it was a, a shoo-in for Donovan uh, uh, to be the head of the CIA. But John Forster Dulles was Secretary of State and said, no, nah, he's too old. Why don't you make my brother? And, and Alan Dulles, who was a, a tier below Donovan in the OSS, was made the, the head of the CIA. And if I could add a bit to that, we had Doug Waller here uh, a month or so ago on his book, Disciples, which we actually have a few left over. And you can also go online and see Doug Waller's comments uh, about the, uh, the uh, CIA directors that came out of the OSS. And I, I want to give Bob credit, to building on what... Uh, on what Pat said. What brought this guy from the East Coast to the Midwest? He rose to be the corporate counsel for Honeywell Corporation. So, a great success, Bob. Little kid, my father was uh, fought in World War II in that, and he was Army, and he was a frogman. He is a Bronze Star, and he had two Purple Hearts in that, but he never talked about it, and then he died when I was quite a bit younger. And that so, but I find no information where the army is given any credit whatsoever. And my father made contact with President Marcus in the Philippines when he was uh, a, a freedom fighter, and that. But I hear nothing. You well, hear I'm, I'm I'm not sure what your father's um, background was, but. I can I can say that the OSS Maritime Unit was a it, it was composite. It was not only the U.S. Navy, but it also involved at the core. There were many Navy veterans like Taylor, but Lambertson actually was a was a captain in the U.S. Army, and there were also Coast Guard individuals in there as well. So it, it had a mixed mixed branch, sort uh, of mixed service branch uh, feel to it, and it was it was all really about trying to find the right person with the right expertise and skill set. And another individual who was part of the U.S. Navy was a guy named Ted Mord. And um, Mord is, you know, you think Taylor's interesting, you think Hayden's interesting. Mord found the lost temple of the monkey god in Honduras in 1941. And that just is, that has been remained a secret until this past January when it was refound. So this guy was the, you, you think that this guy is potentially the, the model for Indiana Jones. <laughs> well, listen, we're going to break it up tonight. Th thank you for coming uh, to a rainy day, Pat. Lee, thank you for uh, representing the American Legion so well. Uh, we have our last program, May 12th, <coughs> next month. Uh, the topic will be on the Potsdam Conference, and I hope that you'll uh, take away from that. That was when a uh, new Harry Truman into office came in and made the decision to drop the atomic bomb, if you remember our program on White Sands uh, a couple of weeks ago. So uh, don't get wet. Have a good uh, April, and uh, we'll see you in May. Thanks for coming. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.
dot mn dash ww two roundtable dot org Production services provided by Barrows Productions.